Coming up on Network Africa. The Nelson Mandela Foundation hails the warm friendship between the late South African president and Queen Elizabeth II. Mixed reactions continue on the continent about the late Queen Elizabeth II's death and her country's colonial legacy. Plus, the African Union welcomes Tigray calls for peace talks in Ethiopia. to the program today, I'm Layo Olamide. South Africa's Nelson Mandela's private secretary has lauded the warm friendship Queen Elizabeth enjoyed with South Africa's former president. Zelda Lagrange recalls when the late anti-apartheid icon once joked about the Queen's weight on a visit to Buckingham Palace, an unheard of liberty attesting to the strong bond between the freedom fighter and the monarch. Well, back in 1995, Mandela sat in the same horse-drawn royal carriage with the Queen through the streets of London, wearing a suit at his first visit to Buckingham Palace before adopting his signature bright African-inspired shirts that helped defy the rigid royal structures reserved for other dignitaries when meeting the Queen. According to Zelda Lagrange, Mandela's private secretary to uh, South Africa's first democratically elected president, the two iconic leaders had a very warm friendship, adding that the Queen and Mandela also shared a sense of duty, service and appreciation for their own nations. The Nelson Mandela Foundation said the two global icons often spoke to each other by phone and used their first names as a mutual sign of respect and affection. very warm friendship is how I'll describe it. Um, they, they, I think they shared the sense of duty, um, the sense of service and a calling that they adhered to throughout their lives. And, 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 and it, there was a deep respect between the two of them. And I think that was the basis of the connection between the two people. There's a few anecdotes, of course, but um, I think uh, what stands out is uh, we, uh, we were in Buckingham Palace once. Of course, when you entered the palace, um, I personally had appreciation for the, the corkies, uh, dogs, the dogs' bowls at the entrance, um, which I loved seeing. It's just, it just puts a human touch to the palace. And um, approaching the Queen, Mr. Mandela walked up to her and he had a very a wicked sense of humour. So um, he, he walked up to the Queen and when he saw her, he said, Elizabeth, you've lost weight. <laughs> and the Queen burst out laughing. Um, I think he was the only person in the world that could comment on the Queen's um, uh, weight and get away with it. Well, as condolences continue to pour in, there are mixed feelings in Kenya and among some other Africans about the late Queen Elizabeth and her country's colonial legacy. Well, Britain once ruled more than half of Africa. Many have fond memories of its longest serving monarch who smiled and waved at crowds in 20 countries across the continent during her 70 year reign. But others remember colonial times like the brutal 1950s crushing of Kenya's Mau Mau Rebellion as the sun set on Britain's empire. 98-year-old Kenyan Gituwaka Hengeri was 17 when he joined the rebellion against British rule. He says he mourns Elizabeth as a human being, but won't forget being detained in a camp by British forces, bitten and denied food. Their empire has gone down and down and down because they did in the past do many bad things to the people of the world. But we are mourning Queen because Queen is a person, a human being. According to Kahengeri, although he is forgiven, he cannot forget. 
forgiving is in the Bible. I am a Christian. I believe in that. But I am not a believer of forgetting. Therefore, we will say, okay, you did what you did. You have said you, are, you have written an apology, uh, 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 a regret letter. If you want to apologize in the future, you can do so. But we will not forget, I personally will not forget that I was incarcerated for seven years. I cannot forget I was put together with my father. I cannot forget I left my children for seven years without food, without education, that I will never forget. The Queen was on a visit to Kenya aged 25 with her husband Philip when she learned of the death of her father King George VI and her ascension to the throne in 1952. She was to return many times to Africa as Queen. Many Africans are not so enthusiastic about celebrating the life of a monarch whose country has a checkered history in Africa. An example is Kenya cartoonist Patrick Gathara who is encouraging people not to forget Britain's colonial past. There's a tendency by some to sort of say, well, the past is the past, just ignore it. It's a nice old lady who has passed. Um, but I'm also encouraged by the fact that there's quite, especially online, quite a vocal uh, uh, a number of people who are, who are refusing to be taken in uh, by this, we're insisting that, no, the history has to be told as it is. We've got to remember it um, as it is. And especially now, when all these tributes are flowing, when all the, um, um, when the fundamentals of that history are being laid down, that we don't accept to be erased any longer, that our stories have to be included in there, the good along with the bad. King Charles' ascension to the throne has also stirred renewed calls from politicians and activists in former colonies in the Caribbean to remove the monarch as their head of state and for Britain to pay reparations for slavery. Lester Wilcox is an African affairs analyst who joins us now for more discussions on the various reactions of Africans concerning the British colonial legacy. Uh, thank you so much for joining us on the program. Thank you for having me. It's my utmost pleasure. Thank you. Well, as much as there has been condolences on the Queen's death, there has also been criticisms of the late monarch about her colonial legacy. What are your thoughts on this? Well, first, let me also join the well-meaning world leaders to send my condolences to King Charles III, uh, the entire British uh, society, and the, indeed the entire Commonwealth, on the demise of this great icon, the, uh, the, the, the Queen that, has, that we all knew that ruled for 70 years. I think it's quite a remarkable thing, and uh, my, my, my position is the fact that um, when you, we are not able to speak about the queen when he was alive, then uh, you had no, there's no moral justification to taunt or to derogate him while he's uh, at, at death. Uh, the queen was not the architect of uh, colonization. Uh, she was born in 1925. Uh, Africa has been colonized. It was born even far after Nigeria was colonized. So, <clears throat> you don't hold the queen responsible totally for what has happened in 18th, 17th, 14th centuries. Britain is not the only country that colonized people. Um, the entire uh, European, uh, the entire Europe colonized places up to the United States of America. The United States of America was, as in modern today, was colonized. France did colon uh, had colonial history. Um, Portugal had, Spain had colonial, Germany had colonial history. I mean, Britain colonized up to India, up to Australia. So I do not understand where this is coming from. And all these countries have all gained independence very long ago. Um, Nigeria is 60, Ghana 57, 
um, so many, so many, so many countries, uh, Kenya, all of them, they've all gained independence. And uh, if after 60 years, you're still holding a queen responsible for what is happening, I say because of colonial past, then I think something is totally wrong. I don't know if the Americans are holding the British response for colonial, or the Australians are holding the British for, for any, any colonial past or whatever. I'm not saying that they don't have a valid point, but to now start using the, 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 the demise of the queen, uh, as a basis of taunting the British Empire or the Queen herself, I think for me it's quite uncharitable and uh, out, totally out of place. Criticised, you know, the late monarch for failing to promote the interests of Africans during that colonial era. Would you say this was the case? Certainly not. If you're holding this Queen responsible, uh, this Queen she became she became a Queen uh, in 1952. And then um, Nigeria gained its pendant eight years after she became So Nigeria should be grateful to the queen. At least Nigeria and some other should be grateful to the queen for granting them independence, which they didn't get before this queen. And also, don't also forget that after colonization, there was the Commonwealth of Nations, for which the queen becomes the president, I mean, the, the head of the Commonwealth. And the queen has visited, listened, and the Commonwealth has promoted various programs for all members of the Commonwealth. The Commonwealth has not is not a trading block. No, it's, sorry, it's not a colonial block that forces you to pay tax to the crown or anything. It is a it is a board that promotes the interest, trade, uh, uh, relationships between her and other colonies. Remember, before 19, before 19, before the Scotland uh, uh, Commonwealth Games, that uh, Nigeria led so many African countries, so many countries to buy cuts. Before then. Uh, uh, entry to UK was um, was visa free. Entry to Canada, entry to Australia, entry among all the Commonwealth nations, Commonwealth nations we had visa free. So there was cross movement, there was there was trade going on. It is even Nigeria should, that should be blamed for it because Nigeria under uh, uh, the FM Minister of Balaji Akinyami that instigated the world to uh, by court that. Uh, 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 Scotland, the uh, uh, Commonwealth Games in 1988, because of apartheid, I think they were trying to protest apartheid in South Africa, and they boycotted the game, and that turned around so many things. There used to be Commonwealth scholarship, which so many people in Africa, in Nigeria, benefited from, which they used to attend uh, to attend the uh, uh, universities abroad. There used to be uh, Commonwealth Games for that has brought us so so. So, so how come we are not looking at the positives of the Commonwealth that the Queen headed and the Queen used to promote general, dis, uh, general discourse? Like I said, before now, going to the UK was visa-free, going to Canada was visa-free, going to Australia was visa-free. Within the Commonwealth is visa-free. Movement of persons, there was trade, there was Commonwealth scholarship, there were, there, there were developmental aid and grants. Uh, uh, citizens of Commonwealth were employed in the Commonwealth uh, uh, Secretariat. Emeka uh, Anyoko, our own Nigerian, was one time a general secretary of, Commonwealth, uh, of, the, of, the, of the Commonwealth. So, what, so, look at these are the positives that the Queen's presented over. Yeah, Mr. Wilcox. looking at the negatives. Yes, my next question will be on, you know, on the Commonwealth group of uh, nations which uh, the Queen used to head, but now the K uh, King Charles III is the head now. So let's talk about uh, re reparations. What, what more can be done, do you know, to bring about reparations to the continent? V very quickly, I might add. Well, reparation to who and for what, and what is the calculations? Now, if we look at the, the gains, the gains of colonization vis-a-vis -vis the negativities. Who should be paying for preparation? Today, we all want to go back to the UK. I, I, let, let me say this. Australia was colonized. Is Australia asking for reparations? They had independence. Canada was colonized. They had independence. The other countries, there so many people in the Caribbean were colonized and they had independence. Why are they not doing better? Why are they waiting for reparation? Reparation in terms of what? For me, you see, you cannot be wanting to go forward and looking back. We've talked about this reparation, reparation, reparation. The Commonwealth, the Commonwealth as a group has done far more. And I think, and I think I'm saying that vastly. We have gained far more from the Commonwealth grouping than we are talking about whatever thing that the British took from you and whatever. Yes, I am not, I'm not, I'm not uh, against, I'm not against people seeking justice for what happened in the past. People that were killed, like you're talking about the Mao Revolution and all that, people that were killed. 
But for goodness sake, after how many years? The queen, the queen ruled for 70 years. And over 70 years ago, more than some, some country over 70 years have ended colonization and they've had their own self rules and they've all been ruling right. themselves. And we still tie ourselves to the apron string. So let's move forward and stop looking back and let's not use the, right. the demise of this great woman as a way of taunting the British Empire or taunting her or her family for whatever for whatever that happened. Most of most people do not even know what happened before now. Most people just, just hear from history, from story. So most people never even knew. So they all just wake up to hear, oh, reparation and all that, and they just jump to Mr. the Mr. Wilcox. I don't even know how to calculate it. So I think we should move forward and congratulate and then uh, uh, have confidence for the Queen, for British people and the Commonwealth and the entire world for losing such a great icon. All right, then, uh, African Affairs Analyst, uh, Alistair Wilcox, thank you uh, for your thoughts. It's my pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. We're still ahead on the program. More tributes for the Queen. Uh, a Cape Town baker creates colorful tributes to the late British monarch. Please stay with us. Welcome back to the program. Uh, in other stories, amid surging humanitarian needs for almost 100,000 refugees who have fled to Uganda so far this year, the UN Refugee Agency, UNHCR, and partners are seeking $68 million for life-saving assistance and services. While well, speaking at a press briefing, the UNHCR representative in Uganda says the humanitarian response is being stretched to breaking point as refugees from South Sudan and the DRC continue to flee violence. At the start of 2022, Uganda was already hosting over 1.5 million refugees, making it one of the most important refugee host countries in the world and the largest on the African continent. As refugees from South Sudan and the Democratic Republic of Congo continue to flee violence and seek safety in Uganda, the humanitarian response is being straight to breaking point. UNHCR and its partners need urgent financial contributions to meet the urgent needs of new refugee arrivals in Uganda to upgrade the reception capacity and basic infrastructure of refugee settlements and prioritize the relocation of refugees to more suitable facilities. In an interagency appeal being revised from uh, April this year, which covered an initial uh, period of three months, UNHCR and 41 partners, including six UN agencies, 25 international and 10 national um, non-governmental organizations, are seeking funds uh, through the end of the year to support up to 150,000 uh, refugees as arrivals uh, continue. By the end of August, UNHCR had received just 38% of its 2022 funding requirement of 343.4 million to respond to the needs of refugees in Uganda, as determined at the start of the year. Children, especially girls, face a high risk of dropping out of school as UNHCR will be unable to pay teacher salaries and already crowded classrooms would increase in size. With no more funding to procure soap and hygiene kits for women and girls, their health and access to education will be negatively affected. The African Union is welcoming an announcement by Tigrayan rebels in northern Ethiopia who say they are willing to take part in peace negotiations. The head of the African Union Commission, Musa Faki Mohamed, says it's a unique opportunity to end the conflict and is urging the rebels and government in Addis Ababa to implement an immediate ceasefire. While fighting resumed in August after several months of calm, but on Sunday, the Tigrayan leadership said it was ready to participate in the peace process under the backing of the African Union. Tigrayan leaders have previously been critical of an AU-led mediation, instead favoring outgoing uh, Kenyan President Uhuru Kenyatta to lead the talks However, there has been no direct reaction from the Ethiopian government, but it has previously said it will talk anytime and anywhere. Kenya's president-elect team has barred local media from covering the presidential inauguration slated for Tuesday, offering exclusive broadcast rights to Multi-Choice Kenya Limited as an affiliate of South African pay TV group. 
Well, Kenyan national broadcaster KBC has a minority shareholding at Multi-Choice Kenya Limited. And the local broadcasters are expected to receive the contractor's live feed. Well, details of the contract haven't been made public, but previous presidential inaugurations have been covered jointly by local media at no cost to the government. The announcement has been met by protests by local journalists and media organizations. However, Mr. Ruto's communications team has defended the decision, saying the contractor will provide a channel for the rest of Africa. Meanwhile, Kenya's outgoing president, Uhuru Kenyatta, has met with his successor, Mr. Ruto, at State House in Nairobi for the first time since the August election. Salt miners on the shores of Senegal's Pink Lake are lamenting in dismay as mounds of salt worth thousands of dollars have been swept away in recent flooding. Well, Senegal, like other countries in the West and Central African region, has recorded above normal rainfall in recent weeks that has unleashed destructive floods after poor drainage systems failed. The Pink Lake, separated by a strip of dune from the Atlantic Ocean, is situated about 35 kilometers from Senegal's capital, Dakar. It's one of the country's most visited sites and under consideration as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Officially known as Lake Reptba, it derives its pinkish hue from an algae that produces the colored pigment. And like the Dead Sea, it's also known for its high salt content. Baba Kaba is one of over 3,000 people who earn a living from the lake, including hundreds of divers who manually rake salt from the bottom of the lake, producing around 38,000 tons annually. As persistent rains drench Senegal, with around 126 millimeters recorded during one spell over the past weekend, according to the Water and Sanitation Ministry, drainage systems and retention reservoirs were quickly overwhelmed and channeled floodwaters towards the lake. We support our families by working the salt. In this area of almost 20 meters, there was salt everywhere. The rainwater washed it away. Now those who can afford it pay excavators between 35,000 and 300,000 to move their salt, while those who cannot afford it pay women to work at a rate of 50 to 100 per basin, depending on the distance. According to Senegal Civil Aviation and Meteorological Agency, rainfall above 50 millimeters in the country is considered extreme. Abdullah Ifati, a hydrologist and lecturer at Dakar's Acheik Anta Diop University, says rising water levels in surrounding plateaus naturally poured into the low-lying lake. He added that water could be contaminated. To be honest, in Senegal, nobody can distinguish between rainwater and wastewater. Both flow together, and that can create health problems. Look in the neighborhood, you will see a quantity of water falling from the sky. And naturally, people will start to open their wastewater drains. So the rain will stop, and we will still see a 24-hour flow. And this is directly related to public health, because the air is polluted. So everything you breathe is not good. So lung disease, coughing, all that develops. With a month to go before the end of Senegal's June to October rainy season, other businesses around the lake, including restaurants and flatboats operators who take tourists on the lake, are counting their losses and worried about the future. Boat hauls on the lake have become dangerous because the lake depth has increased. Finally on the program, as condolences pour in from around the world after Queen Elizabeth's death, a popular Cape Town bakery is adding some color to the tributes by baking petite fours and cookies to commemorate her life. Well, the cupcakes are decorated with tribute messages written in the colors of the Union flag, red, white and blue. Co-owner of Charlie's Bakery, Alexandra Murphy, says the cupcakes are in honor of an irreplaceable monarch. Well, in the Cape Town City Hall, which was lit in the Union flag colors, some residents say, say the Queen's life was worth celebrating and, her, and that her work for the Commonwealth should be remembered.
We've made amazing petty fours, cupcakes and cookies to commemorate the life of Queen Elizabeth II, her, an absolutely irreplaceable monarch with, who was an incredible woman and an incredible loss to this world. How can you not be feeling bad about it, right? I mean, like, she's someone that we grew up with, our parents, and, uh, yeah, I'm so sorry about the... Exactly, and uh, I wish I can get her age, right? And I'm so proud of what she did for the Commonwealth. As much as I may understand that people have different perspectives about it, but I think it's worth the celebration um, in the midst of all the different perspectives that are existing, because um, he's been, she's been a woman that has led um, for quite a long time in a world or in a society where we have patriarchy that is dominating. So it's really something that is worth a celebration. And that's it on the program today. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Lyle Olarinde.